Good evening. Would you like to hear a story? Tonight we'll read The Curse of the Catafalques. I like this story very much. I think it is a little bit scary, but it's also very funny. And, well, I won't spoil it for you. I will say, though, that the Catafalques, while that is in this story the family name of some of the characters, it's also a word. The author picked that word for their name on purpose. A catafalque is a sort of wooden base that a coffin sits upon. Very spooky. Okay, let's get into it. Chapter 1 Unless I am very much mistaken, until the time came when I was subjected to the strange and exceptional experience which I now propose to relate, I had never been brought into close contact with anything of a supernatural description. At least if I ever was, the circumstance can have made no lasting impression upon me, as I am quite unable to recall it. But in the case of the curse of the catafalques, I was confronted with a horror so weird and so altogether unusual that I doubt whether I shall ever succeed in wholly forgetting it, and I know that I have never felt really well since. It is difficult for me to tell my story intelligibly without some account of my previous history by way of introduction, although I will try to make it as little diffuse as I may. I had not been a success at home. I was an orphan, and, in my anxiety to please a wealthy uncle upon whom I was practically dependent, I had consented to submit myself to a series of competitive examinations for quite a variety of professions. But in each successive instance I achieved the same disheartening failure. Some explanation of this may, no doubt, be found in the fact that, with a fatal want of forethought, I had entirely omitted to prepare myself by any particular course of study, which, as I discovered too late, is almost indispensable to success in these intellectual contests." So basically it sounds like he didn't study for the SATs. <laughs> My uncle himself took this view, and, conceiving, not without discernment, that I was by no means likely to retrieve myself by any severe degree of application in the future, he had shipped me out to Australia, where he had correspondents and friends who would put things in my way. They did put several things in my way, and, as might have been expected, I came to grief over every one of them until, at length, having given a fair trial to each opening that had been provided for me, I began to perceive that my uncle had made a grave mistake in believing me suited for a colonial career. I resolved to return home and convince him of his error, and give him one more opportunity of repairing it. He had failed to discover the best means of utilizing my undoubted ability, yet I would not reproach him, nor do I reproach him even now, for I too have felt the difficulty. So he's being a little ironic here, right? He's saying that he knows he doesn't prepare for things, but he's also sort of blaming his uncle for his failures at finding a good career. It's very silly, isn't it? Okay. I'll stop interrupting for now, I promise. Unless I really need to. Okay, here we go. In pursuance of my resolution, I booked my passage home by one of the Orient liners from Melbourne to London. About an hour before the ship was to leave her moorings, I went on board and made my way at once to the stateroom, which I was to share with a fellow passenger, whose acquaintance I then made for the first time. He was a tall, cadaverous young man of about my own age, and my first view of him was not encouraging, for when I came in, I found him rolling restlessly on the cabin floor and uttering hollow groans. "'This will never do,' I said after I had introduced myself. "'If you're like this now, my good sir, what will you be like when we're fairly out at sea? You must husband your resources for that. And why trouble to roll? The ship will do that for you if you will only have the patience.' He explained, somewhat brusquely, that he was suffering from mental agony, not seasickness, and by a little pertinacious questioning, for I would not allow myself to be rebuffed, I was soon in possession of the secret which was troubling my companion, whose name, as I also learned, was Augustus McFadden. 
It seemed that his parents had immigrated before his birth, and he had lived all his life in the colony, where he was contented and fairly prosperous, when an eccentric old aunt of his over in England happened to die. She left McFadden himself nothing, having given by her will the bulk of her property to the only daughter of a baronet of ancient family, in whom she took a strong interest. But the will was not without its effect upon her existence, for it expressly mentioned the desire of the testatrix that the baronet should receive her nephew Augustus, if he presented himself within a certain time, and should afford him every facility for proving his fitness for acceptance as a suitor. The alliance was merely recommended, however, not enjoined, and the gift was unfettered by any conditions. I heard of it first, said McFadden, from Chlorine's father. Chlorine is her name, you know. Sir Paul Catafalque wrote to me, informing me of the mention of my name in my aunt's will, enclosing his daughter's photograph, and formally inviting me to come over and do my best, if my affections were not pre-engaged, to carry out the last wishes of the departed. He added that I might expect to receive shortly a packet from my aunt's executors, which would explain matters fully, and which I should find certain directions for my guidance. The photograph decided me. It was so eminently pleasing that I felt at once my poor aunt's wishes must be sacred to me. I could not wait for the packet to arrive, so I wrote at once to Sir Paul accepting the invitation. Yes, he added with another of the hollow groans, miserable wretch that I am, I pledged my honor to present myself as a suitor, and now, now, here I am, actually embarked upon the desperate errand. He seemed inclined to begin to roll again here, but I stopped him. Really, I said, I think in your place, with an excellent chance, for I presume the lady's heart is also disengaged, with an excellent chance of winning a baronet's daughter with a considerable fortune and a pleasing appearance, I should bear up better. You think so, he rejoined, but you do not know all. The very day after I had dispatched my fatal letter, my aunt's explanatory packet arrived. I tell you that when I read the hideous revelations it contained, and knew to what horrors I had innocently pledged myself, my hair stood on end, and I believe it has remained on end ever since. But it was too late. Here I am, engaged to carry out a task from which my inmost soul recoils. Ah, if I dared but retract. Then why, in the name of common sense, don't you retract? I asked. Write and say that you much regret that a previous engagement, which you had unfortunately overlooked, deprives you of the pleasure of accepting. Impossible, he said. It would be agony to me to feel that I had incurred Chlorine's contempt, even though I only knew her through a photograph at present. If I were to back out of it now, she would have reason to despise me, would she not? Perhaps she would, I said. You see my dilemma. I cannot retract. On the other hand, I dare not go on. The only thing, as I have thought lately, which could save me and my honor at the same time would be my death on the voyage out, for then my cowardice would remain undiscovered. Well, I said, you can die on the voyage out if you want to. There need be no difficulty about that. All you have to do is just to slip over the side some dark night when no one is looking. I tell you what, I added, for somehow I began to feel a friendly interest in this poor, slack-baked creature. If you don't find your nerves equal to it when the time comes to the point, I don't mind giving you a leg over myself. Isn't that kind of him to help, to help his roommate on the, on the ship kill himself? <laughs> See, the way that this author writes is just absurd, and that's what I think makes this story very funny. Okay, I promised I'd stop interrupting, so let, let's move on. I never intended to go as far as that, he said rather pettishly, and without any sign of gratitude for my offer. I don't care about the actually dying. If she could only be made to believe I had died, that would be quite enough for me. I could live on here, happy in the thought that I was saved from her scorn. But how can she be made to believe it? That's the point. Precisely, I said. You can hardly write her yourself and inform her that you died on the voyage. You might do this, though, and go to seek her under another name and break the sad intelligence to her. 
Why, to be sure, I might do that, he said with some animation. I should certainly not be recognized. She can have no photograph of me, for I have never been photographed. And yet, no, he added with a shudder, it is useless. I can't do it. I dare not trust myself under that roof. I must find some other way. You have given me an idea. Listen, he said after a short pause. You seem to take an interest in me. You are going to London. The catafalques live there, or near it, at some place called Parsons Green. Can I ask a great favor of you? Would you very much mind seeking them out yourself as a fellow voyager of mine? I could not expect you to tell a positive untruth on my account, but if, in the course of an interview with Chlorine, you could contrive to convey the impression that I had died on my way to her side, you would be doing me a service I can never repay. I should very much prefer to do you a service that you could repay, was my very natural rejoinder. She will not require strict proof, he continued eagerly. I could give you enough papers and things to convince her that you come from me. Say you will do me this kindness. I hesitated for some time longer, not so much, perhaps, from scruples of a conscientious kind as from a disinclination to undertake a troublesome commission for an entire stranger, gratuitously. But McFadden pressed me hard, and at length he made an appeal to springs in my nature which are never touched in vain, and I yielded. When we had settled the question in its financial aspect, I said to McFadden, the only thing now is, how would you prefer to pass away? Shall I make you fall over and be devoured by a shark? That would be a picturesque end. And I could do myself justice over the shark. I should make the young lady weep considerably. That won't do at all, he said irritably. I can see from her face that Chlorine is a girl of a delicate sensibility, and would be disgusted by the idea of any suitor of hers spending his last cohesive moments inside such a beastly repulsive thing as a shark. I don't want to be associated in her mind with anything so unpleasant. No, sir, I will die, if you will oblige me by remembering it, of a low fever, of a non-infectious type at sunset, gazing at her portrait with my fading eyesight, and gasping her name with my last breath. She will cry more over that. I might work it up into something effective, certainly, I admitted, and, by the way, if you are going to expire in my stateroom, I ought to know a little bit more about you than I do. There is time still before the tender goes. You might do worse than to spend it in coaching me in your life's history. He gave me a few leading facts, and supplied me with several documents for study on the voyage. He even abandoned to me the whole of his traveling arrangements, which proved far more complete and serviceable than my own. And then the all-ashore bell rang, and McFadden, as he bade me farewell, took from his pocket a bulky packet. "'You have saved me,' he said. "'Now I can banish every recollection of this miserable episode. "'I need no longer preserve my poor aunt's directions. "'Let them go, then.' Before I could say anything, he had fastened something heavy to the parcel and dropped it through the cabin light into the sea, after which he went ashore, and I have never seen nor heard of him since. During the voyage I had leisure to think seriously over the affair, and the more I thought of the task I had undertaken, the less I liked it. No man with the instincts of a gentleman can feel any satisfaction at finding himself on the way to harrow up a poor young lady's feelings by a perfectly fictitious account of the death of a poor-spirited suitor who could selfishly save his reputation at her expense. And so strong was my feeling about this from the very first that I doubt whether, if McFadden's terms had been a shade less liberal, I could have brought myself to consent. But it struck me that, under judiciously sympathetic treatment, the lady might prove not inconsolable, and that I myself might be able to heal the wound I was about to inflict. I found a subtle pleasure in the thought of this, for, unless McFadden had misinformed me, Chlorine's fortune was considerable, and did not depend upon any marriage she might or might not make. On the other hand, I was penniless, and it seemed to me only too likely that her parents might seek to found some objection to me on that ground. 
I studied the photograph McFadden had left with me. It was that of a pensive but distinctly pretty face, with an absence of firmness in it that betrayed a plastic nature. I felt certain that if I only had the recommendation, as McFadden had, of an aunt's dying wishes, it would not take me long to effect a complete conquest. And then, as naturally as possible, came the thought, why should not I procure myself the advantages of this recommendation? Nothing could be easier. I merely had to present myself as Augustus McFadden, who was hitherto a mere name to them. The information I already possessed, as to his past life, would enable me to support the character, and as it seemed that the baronet lived in great seclusion, I could easily contrive to keep out of the way of the few friends and relations I had in London until my position was secure. What harm would this innocent deception do to any one? McFadden, even if he ever knew, would have no right to complain. He had given up all pretensions himself, and if he was merely anxious to preserve his reputation, his wishes would be more than carried out, for I flattered myself that whatever ideal Chlorine might have formed of her desired suitor, I should come much nearer to it than poor McFadden could have ever done. No, he would gain, positively gain, by my assumption. He could not have counted upon arousing more than a mild regret as it was. Now he would be fondly, it might be madly, loved. By proxy, it is true, but that was far more than he deserved. Chlorine was not injured, far from it. She would have a suitor to welcome, not weep over, and his mere surname could make no possible difference to her. And lastly, it was a distinct benefit to me. For with a new name and an excellent reputation, success would be an absolute certainty. What wonder, then, that the scheme, which opened out a far more manly and honorable means of obtaining a livelihood than any I had previously contemplated, should have grown more attractively feasible each day, until I resolved at last to carry it out? Let rigid moralists blame me if they will. I have never pretended to be better than the average run of mankind, though I am certainly no worse, and no one who really knows what human nature is will reproach me very keenly for obeying what was almost an instinct. And I may say this, that if ever an unfortunate man was bitterly punished for a fraud which was harmless, if not actually pious, by a visitation of intense and protracted terror, that person was I." Sort of an ominous end to an otherwise humorous first chapter. Let's continue to chapter two. After arriving in England and before presenting myself at Parsons Green in my assumed character, I took one precaution against any danger there might be of my throwing away my liberty into a fit of youthful impulsiveness. I went to Somerset House and carefully examined the probate copy of the late Miss Petronia McFadden's last will and testament. Nothing could have been more satisfactory. A sum of between forty and fifty thousand pounds was Chlorine's unconditionally, just as McFadden had said. I searched, but could find nothing in the will whatever to prevent her property, under the then existing state of the law, from passing under the entire control of a future husband. After this, then, I could no longer restrain my ardor, and so, one foggy afternoon about the middle of December, I found myself driving towards the house in which I reckoned upon achieving a comfortable independence. Parsons Green was reached at last, a small triangular open space bordered on two of its sides by mean and modern erections, but on the third by some ancient mansions, gloomy and neglected-looking indeed, but with traces on them still of their former consequence. My cab stopped before the gloomiest of them all, a square, grim house with dull and small-paned windows, flanked by two narrow and projecting wings, and built of dingy brick, faced with yellowstone. Some old scrollwork railings, with a corroded frame in the middle for a long-departed oil lamp, separated the house from the road. Inside was a semicircular patch of rank grass, and a damp gravel sweep led from the heavy gate to a square portico supported by two wasted black wooden pillars. 
As I stood there, after pulling the pear-shaped bell handle, and heard the bell tinkling and jangling fretfully within, and as I glanced up at the dull house front looming cheerless out of the fog-laden December twilight, I felt my confidence beginning to abandon me for the first time, and I really was almost inclined to give the whole thing up and run away. Before I could make up my mind, a moldy and melancholy butler had come down slowly from the sweep and opened the gate, and my opportunity had fled. Later I remembered how, as I walked along the gravel, a wild and wailing scream pierced the heavy silence. It seemed at once a lamentation and a warning, but as the district railway was quite near, I did not attach any particular importance to the sound at the time. I followed the butler through a dank and chilly hall, where an antique lamp hung glimmering feebly through its panes of dusty stained glass, up a broad carved staircase and along some torturous paneled passages, until at length I was ushered into a long and rather low reception room, scantily furnished with the tarnished mirrors and spindle-legged brocaded furniture of a bygone century. A tall and meager old man, with a long white beard and haggard, sunken black eyes, was seated at one side of the high chimney-piece, while opposite him sat a little limp old lady with a nervous expression, and dressed in trailing black robes relieved by a little yellow lace about the head and throat. As I saw them, I recognized at once that I was in the presence of Sir Paul Catafalque and his wife. They both rose slowly and advanced arm in arm in their old-fashioned way, and met me with a stately solemnity. "'You are indeed welcome,' they said in faint, hollow voices. "'We thank you for this proof of your chivalry and devotion. It cannot be but that such courage and such self-sacrifice will meet with their reward.' And although I did not quite understand how they could have discerned, as yet, that I was chivalrous and devoted, I was too glad to have made a good impression to do anything but beg them not to mention it. And then a slender figure with a drooping head, a wan face, and large sad eyes came softly down the dimly lighted room toward me, and I and my destined bride met for the first time. As I had expected after she had once anxiously raised her eyes and allowed them to rest upon me, her face was lighted up by an evident relief as she discovered that the fulfillment of my aunt's wishes would not be so distasteful to her, personally, as it might have been. For myself, I was upon the whole rather disappointed in her. The portrait had flattered her considerably. The real chlorine was thinner and paler than I had been led to anticipate, while there was a settled melancholy in her manner which I felt would prevent her from being an exhilarating companion. And I must say I prefer a touch of archness and animation in womankind, and, if I had been free to consult my own tastes, should have greatly preferred to become a member of a more cheerful family. Under the circumstances, however, I was not entitled to be too particular, and I put up with it. From the moment of my arrival, I fell easily and naturally into the position of an honored guest, who might be expected in time to form nearer and dearer relations with the family, and certainly I was afforded every opportunity of doing so. I made no mistakes, for the diligence with which I had got up McFadden's antecedents enabled me to give perfectly satisfactory replies to most of the few allusions or questions that were addressed to me, and I drew upon my imagination for the rest. But those days I spent in the baronet's family were far from lively. The catafalques went nowhere, they seemed to know no body, at least no visitors ever called or dined there while I was with them, and the time dragged slowly on in a terrible monotony in that dim tomb of a house, which I was not expected to leave except for very brief periods, for Sir Paul would grow uneasy if I walked out alone, even to Putney. There was something, indeed, about the attitude of both the old people towards myself which I could only consider as extremely puzzling. They would follow me about with jealous care, blended with anxious alarm, and their faces as they looked at me wore an expression of tearful admiration, touched with something of pity, as for some youthful martyr. At times, too, they spoke of the gratitude they felt, and professed a determined hopelessness as to my ultimate success. 
Now, I was well aware that this is not the ordinary bearing of the parents of an heiress to a suitor who, however deserving in other respects, is both obscure and penniless, and the only way in which I could account for it was by the supposition that there was some latent defect in Chlorine's temper or constitution which entitled the man who won her to commiseration, and which would also explain their evident anxiety to get her off their hands. But although anything of this kind would be, of course, a drawback, I felt that forty or fifty thousand pounds would be a fair set-off, and I could not expect everything. When the time came at which I felt I could safely speak to Chlorine of what lay nearest my heart, I found an unforeseen difficulty in bringing her to confess that she reciprocated my passion. She seemed to shrink unaccountably from speaking the word which gave me the right to claim her, confessing that she dreaded it not for her own sake, but for mine alone, which struck me as an unpleasantly morbid trait in so young a girl. Again and again I protested that I was willing to run all risks, as I was, and again and again she resisted, though always more faintly, until at last my efforts were successful, and I forced from her lips the assent which was of so much importance to me. But it cost her a great effort, and I believe she even swooned immediately afterwards, but this is only conjecture, as I lost no time in seeking Sir Paul and clenching the matter before Chlorine had time to react. I think that's a pretty good image of Chlorine about to faint and he just runs away from her to go get her father's permission to marry before she can change her mind, just leaving her there swooning anyway. He heard what I had to tell him with a strange light of triumph and relief in his wary eyes. You have made an old man very happy and hopeful, he said. I ought, perhaps, even now to defer you, but I am too selfish for that. And you are young and brave and ardent. Why need we despair? I suppose, he added, looking keenly at me, you would prefer as little delay as possible. I should indeed, I replied. I was pleased, for I had not expected to find him so sensible as that. Then leave all preliminaries to me. When the day and time have been settled, I will let you know. As you are aware, it will be necessary to have your signature to this document. And here, my boy, I must in conscience warn you solemnly that by signing this you make your decision irrevocable. Irrevocable, do you understand? When I had heard this, I need scarcely say that I was in all eagerness to sign. So great was my haste that I did not even try to decipher the somewhat crabbed and antiqued writing in which the terms of the agreement were set out. I was anxious to impress the baronet with a sense of my gentlemanly feeling and the confidence I had in him. While I naturally presumed that, since the contract was binding upon me, the baronet would, as a man of honor, hold it equally conclusive on his own side. As I look back upon it now, it seems simply extraordinary that I should have been so easily satisfied, have taken so little pains to find out the exact position in which I was placing myself, but... With the ingenious confidence of youth, I fell an easy victim, as I was to realize later, with terrible enlightenment. "'Say nothing of this to Chlorine,' said Sir Paul, as I handed him the document signed. "'Until the final arrangements are made, it will only distress her unnecessarily.' I wondered why at the time, but I promised to obey, supposing that he knew best, and for some days after that I made no mention to Chlorine of the approaching day which was to witness our union. As we were continually together, I began to regard her with an esteem which I had not thought possible at first. Her looks improved considerably under the influence of happiness, and I found she could converse intelligently enough upon several topics, and did not bore me nearly as much as I was fully prepared for. And so the time passed less heavily, until one afternoon the baronet took me aside mysteriously. "'Prepare yourself, Augustus,' they had all learned to call me Augustus, he said. "'All is arranged. The event upon which our dearest hopes depend is fixed for tomorrow, in the grey chamber, of course, and at midnight.' I thought this a curious time and place for the ceremony, but I had divined his eccentric passion for privacy and retirement, and only imagined that he had procured some very special form of license. "'But you do not know the grey chamber,' he added. 
Come with me, and I will show you where it is. And he led me up the broad staircase, and, stopping at the end of a passage before an immense door covered with black bays and studded with brass nails, which gave it a hideous resemblance to a gigantic coffin lid, he pressed a spring, and it fell slowly back. I saw a long, dim gallery, whose very existence nothing in the external appearance of the mansion had led me to suspect. It led to a heavy oaken door with cumbrous plates and fastenings of metal. "'Tomorrow night is Christmas Eve, as you are doubtless aware,' he said in a hushed voice. "'At twelve, then, you will present yourself at yonder door, the door of the Grey Chamber, where you must fulfill the engagement you have made.' I was surprised at his choosing such a place for the ceremony. It would have been more cheerful in the long drawing-room, but it was evidently a whim of his, and I was too happy to think of opposing it. I hastened at once to Chlorine, with her father's sanction, and told her that the crowning moment of both our lives was fixed at last. The effect of my announcement was astonishing. She fainted, for which I remonstrated with her as soon as she came to herself. Such extreme sensitivities, my love, I could not help saying, may be highly creditable to your sense of maidenly propriety, but allow me to say that I can scarcely regard it as a compliment. Augustus, she said, you must not think I doubt you, and yet, and yet, the ordeal will be a severe one for you. I will steal my nerves, I said grimly, for I was annoyed with her. And, after all, Chlorine, the ceremony is not invariably fatal. I have heard the victim surviving it, occasionally. How brave you are, she said earnestly. I will imitate you, Augustus. I, too, will hope. I really thought her insane, which alarmed me for the validity of the marriage. Yes, I am weak, foolish, I know, she continued. But, oh, I shudder so when I think of you, away in that gloomy grey chamber, going through it all alone. This confirmed my worst fears. No wonder her parents felt grateful to me for relieving them of such a responsibility. May I ask where you intend to be at the time? I inquired very quietly. You will not think us unfeeling, she replied. But dear Papa considered that such anxiety as ours would be scarcely endurable did we not seek some distraction from it, and so, as a special favor, he has procured evening orders for Sir John Sowain's museum in Lincoln Inn Fields, where we shall drive immediately after dinner. I knew that the proper way to treat the insane was by reasoning with them gently, so as to place their own absurdity clearly before them. If you are forgetting your anxiety in Sir John Sowain's museum, while I cool my heels in the grey chamber, I said, is it probable that any clergyman will be intended to perform the marriage ceremony? Did you really think two people could be united separately? She was astonished this time. You are joking, she cried. You cannot really believe that we are to be married in, in the grey chamber. "'Then will you tell me where we are to be married?' I asked. "'I think I have the right to know. It can hardly be at the museum.' She turned upon me with a sudden misgiving. "'I could almost fancy,' she said anxiously, "'that this is no feigned ignorance. "'Augustus, your aunt sent you a message. "'Tell me, have you read it?' Now, owing to McFadden's want of consideration, this was my one weak point. I had not read it, and thus I felt myself upon delicate ground. The message evidently related to business of importance which was to be transacted in this grey chamber, and as the genuine McFadden clearly knew all about it, it would have been simply suicidal to confess my own ignorance. "'Why, of course, darling, of course,' I said hastily. You must think no more of my silly joke. There is something I have to arrange in the grey chamber before I can call you mine. But tell me, why does it make you so uneasy? I added, thinking it might be prudent to find out beforehand what formality was expected from me. I cannot help it. No, I cannot, she cried. The test is so searching. Are, 
Are you sure that you are prepared at all points? I overheard my father say that no precaution could safely be neglected. I have such a terrible foreboding that, after all, this may come between us. It was clear enough to me now. The baronet was by no means so simple and confiding in his choice of son-in-laws as I had imagined, and had no intention, after all, of accepting me without some inquiry into my past life, my habits, and my prospects. That he should seek to make this examination more impressive by appointing this ridiculous midnight interview for it was only what might have been expected from an old man of his confirmed eccentricity. But I knew I could easily contrive to satisfy the baronet, and with the idea of consoling Chlorine, I said as much. "'Why will you persist in treating me like a child, Augustus?' she broke out almost petulantly. "'They have tried to hide it all from me. But do you suppose I do not know that in the Grey Chamber you will have to encounter one far more formidable, far more difficult to satisfy?' "'Then poor dear Papa, "'I see you know more than I—' "'More than I thought you did,' I said. "'Let us understand one another, Chlorine. "'Tell me exactly how much you know.' "'I have told you all I know,' she said. "'It is your turn to confide in me.' "'Not even for your sweet sake, my dearest,' I was obliged to say. "'Can I break the seal that is set upon my tongue?' "'You must not press me. Come, let us talk of other things.' But now I saw that matters were worse than I had thought. Instead of the feeble old baronet, I should have to deal with a stranger, some exacting and officious friend or relation, perhaps, or, more probably, a keen family solicitor who would put questions I should not care about answering, and even be capable of assisting upon strict settlements.' It was that, of course, they would try to tie my hands by a strict settlement, with a brace of cautious trustees, unless I was very careful. All I should get by marriage would be a paltry life interest contingent upon my surviving my wife. This revolted me. It seems to me that when law comes in with its offensively suspicious restraints upon the husband, and its indelicately premature provisions for the offspring, all the poetry of love is gone at once. By allowing the wife to receive the income for her separate use and free from the control of her husband, as the phrase runs, you infallibly brush the bloom from the peach, and implant the little speck within the fruit which, as Tennyson beautifully says, will widen by and by and make the music mute. This may be overstrained on my part, but it represents my honest conviction. I was determined to have nothing to do with law. If it was necessary, I felt quite sure enough of Chlorine to defy Sir Paul. I would refuse to meet a family solicitor anywhere, and I intended to say so plainly at the first convenient opportunity. That's the end of chapter two. Next video, we'll pick up with chapter three and the conclusion to this very strange story. But to start off with, I want to say, I think it's very funny the way the main character discusses poetry and romance, as if he doesn't very obviously want to marry Chlorine strictly for the money, and may even very well abandon her at the first opportunity. I think it's very clear that he doesn't he doesn't seem to dislike Chlorine. He talks about how she livens up a little bit when she's happier, and um, so I think he might even enjoy her company a little bit, but he obviously doesn't love her. I think he's made that abundantly clear in a number of ways. All right, we'll meet up again for chapter three. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Until then, good night.